Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today we're beginning our investigation into Samsung's new Odyssey Neo monitors, starting with the Neo G7, and shortly we'll also have a review of the Neo G8. These new products have caught the attention of many monitor shoppers as they offer quite an impressive spec sheet and true HDR hardware without costing absolutely absurd amounts of money. However, Samsung doesn't have a great track record with their previous Odyssey VA monitors. For example, the Odyssey Neo G9 was plagued with issues, some were addressed with firmware updates and others remain to this day. So the Neo G7 has the potential to either, I guess, really impress me or really disappoint me depending on whether Samsung can be bothered making it good. There is no doubting that Samsung are putting up an impressive spec sheet. The Neo G7 is a 32-inch 4K VA LCD with a 165Hz refresh rate, so already pretty high-end hardware for a gaming monitor. But the key addition here is the mini LED backlight with 1196 dimming zones, giving us proper local dimming functionality that you need for HDR content, and brightness up to what Samsung claims is 2000 nits. All of this is being offered for well below previous monitors with similar specs. Its MSRP is just $1,300 US, and I've seen it already for $1,100 despite launching just last month. We bought our review sample and imported it from the US, so a big shout out to our Patreon and Floatplay members who support our independent testing and allow reviews like this to happen. Today's video is sponsored by Gigabyte. The latest Aorus and Gigabyte gaming and creator laptops feature up to an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3080 Ti graphics card and up to 12th gen Intel Core i9 processors. This powerful combination of hardware is great whether you're a gamer or creator. Gamers will be interested in the Aorus 17X featuring high performance GeForce RTX graphics, a super fast 360Hz display, and heaps of cooling power. The RTX 3080 Ti model is very impressive in the speed it delivers for gaming in a laptop form factor, especially with DLSS enabled. Learn more via the links below, including the Remix contest where you can win an Aero 15 OLED laptop. Of course, the Neo G7 isn't the flagship product from Samsung's new range. That is the Neo G8, which bumps the refresh rate up to 240Hz and is priced at $1,500 US. All other specifications appear to be the same, so with the Neo G7, you're essentially saving $200 to get a reduced refresh rate. And let's face it, running games at 4K 240Hz will be an immense challenge outside the most lightweight eat sports type games. The 165Hz on offer with the Neo G7 is difficult enough. From a design perspective, Samsung have used the same sort of general style as the Odyssey G7 that debuted in 2020, but with a few minor tweaks to areas like the OSD controls. The general construction is all plastic, and the same kind of cool pattern is being used on the back, which accentuates the curve. In the center, you'll find an RGB LED light ring, which looks great in my opinion, one of the better implementations of lighting on a monitor. There are also some LEDs on the front, though unlike the rear lights, I don't feel these front sections add much at all. While I don't mind the general aesthetic, I do have a few issues with the build. The first one is that the stand isn't very sturdy, the display section is quite big and it wobbles a lot. It does provide a good range of ergonomic adjustments, but if you bump your desk or try use the OSD controls, expect the monitor to move around a bit. The second is the curve. Once again, the Neo G7 uses a 1000R curvature, the same as their other VA entries in the series. On a 16x9 aspect ratio display, the curve adds nothing and in my opinion makes the overall experience worse, especially for productivity apps where the curve is noticeable and introduces distortions. Now I don't mind a curve on an ultra wide panel where the edges extend to the outer parts of your field of view, but with a 32 inch display like this, the entire panel is well within your eyes FOV at normal viewing distances. I think it looks kind of weird, and while you will get used to it over time, my preference for these sorts of displays has always been a flat panel, and I don't think it adds the immersion that Samsung claims. As for ports, we get one DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC and two HDMI 2.1 ports. The HDMI ports are 40 gigabits per second ports and implement DSC to achieve a 165Hz refresh rate, though you shouldn't have compatibility issues with other devices. There's also a few USB ports, though unfortunately no KVM switch functionality which is becoming increasingly popular for monitors like this. The on-screen display is controlled through a directional pad along the bottom edge and includes Samsung's typical set of features which is good but not the strongest on the market. You do get functionality like crosshairs and eye saver mode and use upgradable firmware though. 
Before diving into the response time performance, I wanted to discuss Samsung's quality control for the Neo G7 and whether they've addressed some of the previous criticisms we've had of their products, especially the Neo G9. And luckily for buyers, I can report that the Neo G7 is a far better monitor in terms of dealing with typical Samsung issues. And as a reminder, this isn't a golden review sample or anything. I bought this monitor from B&H, it's retail stock, the exact same as any buyer should be receiving. Scan lines, not an issue with the Neo G7, at least not to the extent of the Neo G9 or original Odyssey G7. Pixel inversion test patterns that would instantly trigger scan lines on the Neo G9 are displayed just fine on the Neo G7. Flickering is also not an issue, even with the VRR controls set to off. And I flogged this thing with extremely fast refresh rate changes and huge leaps in refresh rate to try and trigger flickering, but I didn't spot any. So the VRR control setting isn't needed as far as I can tell. However, in the past, people have used obscure test patterns or niche games and found issues with Samsung monitors, so I'm hesitant to call this a complete success as I can't feasibly test everything. If you're super concerned about these issues and would find them an instant deal breaker, Samsung's history of poor quality control may be enough to see you avoid the Neo G7, even though I found fewer issues than past products. There is a likely cause for the improved performance of the Neo G7 though, and that's its refresh rate of just 165Hz. Previous Samsung monitors mostly or exclusively had issues at the maximum 240Hz refresh rate, particularly for scan lines. Dropping the refresh to 200Hz or lower often solved these issues. It's possible that the Neo G7's lower refresh is preventing any issues from showing up, so we'll have to test the Neo G8 with its 240Hz refresh to see whether this family of panels still has age-old Samsung problems. For response time performance, the Neo G7 is similar to other Samsung monitors in that if you're using it with Adaptive Sync enabled, you cannot adjust the overdrive setting. However, the included mode is suitable, offering a 4.12 millisecond response time average at 165Hz and minimal levels of overshoot. While not as fast as the original G7 or the Neo G9 at 240Hz, this level of performance is quite similar to either of those monitors running at 165Hz. Not exactly the same, but similar behaviour. You'll also see virtually no dark level smearing, which is a key selling point of Samsung's VA displays over any other VA monitor on the market. As we move down the refresh rate range, generally the monitor gets a bit slower and has more overshoot visible. The Neo G7 does not appear to have the same level of variable overdrive as other high-end Odyssey VA monitors, but performance still holds up well at lower refresh rates. At 60Hz for example, while the inverse ghosting rate is approximately 30%, the average error is quite low and cumulative deviation is still serviceable. These numbers illustrate what you see visually, which is that inverse ghosting is not very visible at 60Hz, although it is there if you look closely. I would have preferred to see better variable overdrive like we got on the Odyssey G7, however what the Neo G7 provides is still good enough for a single overdrive mode experience, not, not that you could change it anyway. This display is fast as far as LCDs go, and you'll get those benefits at all refresh rates. However, the response times I've been talking about so far relate to the Neo G7's performance when local dimming is disabled. When the FALD backlight is enabled, this becomes a more complicated discussion, as the response behavior you'll see is not only dictated by a specific pixel, but by the pixels around it that encompass the local dimming zone. Both the backlight and the LCD layer work in tandem to produce the response and change in color value, so what does this look like? Well, here are some example transitions using the monitor with various backlight settings enabled. The FALD system does extend response times generally speaking, but this is in relation to how dark the monitor needs to get. Transitions between moderate or bright shades typically see no impact from the FALD system. Lower backlight settings take longer to transition on purpose, so you can tune the appearance to your liking. The big question is whether the FALD system affects motion clarity while gaming. When using this display for gaming, I'd say for the most part you'll see transitions most like the earlier charts, where the backlight is only making minor adjustments that don't have a significant effect on response times. However, there are some times, particularly when an entire zone changes from dark to bright, that you can feel the display is a bit slower with local dimming enabled, depending on the setting you choose. The high local dimming setting also appears to have some overshoot issues that can cause a flicker-like effect on rare occasions, though I don't believe this is a true flicker and it goes away when changing the setting to low. I don't think this outweighs the benefits of having local dimming, and in any case if you are concerned about speed, for example if you're playing a competitive game, you can simply disable local dimming to get the best performance on offer. Compared to other displays, there's some interesting points to be made comparing the best performance at the highest refresh rate. 
The Neo G7 is clearly a bit slower than other Samsung VAs, but with lower overshoot as well, this isn't a big issue. Performance ends up similar to the excellent ASUS PG279QM, and generally better than most other IPS monitors, especially those that are 32 inches in size. The Neo G7 mops the floor with the PG32UQX, the only real LCD equivalent to this Neo G9 in its HDR dimming capabilities, this new VA is significantly faster. However, and this shouldn't be a major surprise, the Neo G7 does easily get beaten by OLED panels. For average performance in my opinion, the Neo G7 isn't quite as well tuned as the older G7 and Neo G9, but it still produces good results across the refresh range. The newest competitors are 27 inch IPS models, but again, the Neo G7 holds a decent lead over 32 inch 4K high refresh monitors. However, OLED panels are in the range of three times faster, so those that must have the clearest experience will be better off with Alienware's AW3423DW. As mentioned earlier, dark level smearing is not a concern with the Neo G7, with this display performing on par with IPS monitors in this area. Samsung's tuning is far better for VAs than most other display OEMs can manage. As for cumulative deviation, the Neo G7 is a very strong monitor, though again not as good as the other Odyssey VA options I've tested, coming in with a 20% higher result. However, this keeps the Neo G7 ahead of most IPS and non-HDR competitors, especially those of a similar panel size. Once again, OLED panels are significantly faster, they're the class leader in this price tier and have zero issues with overshoot at all refresh rates. At a fixed 120Hz, the Neo G7 is very fast, outperforming other models with the exception of OLEDs. I was also happy with the performance at 60Hz, we're not getting the outright best results, especially compared to an OLED, but the speed on offer here is very solid compared to similar products. Input latency is an interesting story. With local dimming disabled, there are no issues with latency, the monitor's processing delays around 1 millisecond, and this leads to very responsive experiences given the modest 165Hz refresh rate. However, if you decide to enable local dimming, the processing delay increases to approximately 10 milliseconds, which is rather slow, though not unusable. It's double that of the AW3423DW, and more than the InZone M9's 8 millisecond processing delay with dimming enabled. This means that for competitive gamers, I'd recommend disabling the FALD backlight, at which point you may as well not buy this monitor, as the FALD backlight is the main selling point and what makes it expensive. Power consumption is high, though only marginally higher than the PG32UQX, which also features a 1000 plus zone FALD backlight and similar panel size. The FALD feature consumes roughly 20 watts more than a similar monitor without FALD, though far less power than an OLED displaying a worst case full white image. The Neo G7 does support backlight strobing, which is a rarity for monitors with a mini LED backlight. Unfortunately, Samsung doesn't give users any control over the feature, and you can't enable it with adaptive sync simultaneously. This significantly weakens its usability, but nevertheless let's look at how it performs. At 160Hz there is a noticeable double image and some blur overall, though the image is clearer than playing with strobing disabled, so I'm sure some users will find this beneficial. Unfortunately, at lower refresh rates this strobed crosstalk gets worse and even appears to vary, suggesting the backlight and refresh rate aren't properly in sync at times. In most circumstances, I wouldn't use this feature. The Neo G7, like most gaming monitors of today, packs a wide color gamut, 93.5% DCI P3, which isn't quite high enough for color accurate P3 work, but this isn't a very versatile creator monitor anyway due to its curve. The overall Rec 2020 gamut is slightly higher than some of Samsung's past VA monitors, but not quite high enough to push it into the upper echelon of our chart here, which is dominated by IPS LCDs. Factory calibration was weak with my unit, in particular there was a red tint and darker blacks than what should be the case, which led to mediocre Delta E results. Color performance was also relatively unimpressive due to an unclamped color gamut. For SDR content, the Neo G7 should be using the sRGB color space, but this is left unclamped by default, which leads to oversaturation. This isn't unusual for a gaming display, lots of monitors in the charts here have poor color checker factory results, however the grayscale result could definitely be better, it's one of the weaker results. Samsung include an sRGB mode which works and limits the color gamut to sRGB, which is good for SDR content and prevents oversaturation. However, grayscale performance is not that different to the default mode, so there's still a red tint, and Samsung don't provide a way to adjust the white balance in this mode, it's all locked down. This means that despite advertising factory calibration on their website, I don't think any mode included with the Neo G7 qualifies properly as being calibrated, and certainly the results are no better than a typical gaming display that doesn't advertise factory calibration. 
However, if you do choose to calibrate the display yourself, you can improve performance, especially for sRGB, as the panel is capable of covering the entirety of this gamut. For P3, like I said, I don't think the gamut coverage is quite good enough for color accurate work, but with such a strong gaming focus here, I don't think the Neo G7 is a great monitor for productivity tasks anyway. One thing I did find unusual about the Neo G7 is how the auto local dimming setting works. The OSD indicates that this setting will turn dimming on or off depending on whether the content is HDR, implying for SDR content that auto would see local dimming disabled. However, that's not how it works. If you use auto, then local dimming remains enabled on a lower than low setting when showing SDR content. This isn't ideal given that local dimming can have issues with some SDR productivity apps, particularly when trying to show high contrast edges. Ideally, the auto setting would fully switch local dimming off, but for users that want this, you'll have to do it manually. Brightness in the SDR mode is relatively low at just 332 nits, which is similar to some other Odyssey products. I don't think this is a deal breaker though, as 300 nits is still very usable in most viewing environments, especially when combined with the matte screen coding. However, I know some people love to use their monitors at max brightness, in which case the Neo G7 isn't great. Minimum brightness is excellent though, allowing for a great experience in dark viewing conditions. When assessing the panel's native contrast ratio, I've disabled local dimming entirely, so we can see just how good this VA is. And I'm pleased to see a very strong result of over 4000 to 1, which nicely complements the dimming functionality for HDR. This contrast ratio is much higher than the Odyssey G7 and Neo G9, suggesting that improvements have been made to how the display works, and it blows IPS LCDs out of the water entirely. Even when you disable dimming, the Neo G7 shows far deeper blacks than IPS alternatives, Though of course OLEDs with their infinite contrast ratios are a step above again. Viewing angles aren't great on the Neo G7 and are exacerbated by the curve. You'll want to be looking at this display dead on for the best experience. As for uniformity, my unit was okay, but when viewing some full screen single color images I did spot a minor amount of dirty screen effect, particularly with mid grays. The mini LEDs don't appear to be 100% uniform, which might be noticeable in some productivity apps though, I don't expect you'll notice while gaming or consuming content. Now let's assess arguably the most important area to the performance of the Neo G7, and that's its HDR performance. This is a true HDR display with the hardware capabilities to display HDR correctly to some degree. It has high brightness, full array local dimming with plenty of zones, and a wide color gamut. It also doesn't appear to have any obvious firmware issues with HDR, unlike the Neo G9, so some games don't look absolutely horrible upon first use. I tried a range of games that triggered the Neo G9's poor HDR experience and didn't see any of the characteristic washing out, so that's a good sign at least. As far as the local dimming capabilities are concerned, Samsung are providing 1,196 zones in a 46 by 26 grid, so each zone is tasked with roughly 7,000 pixels. This is an order of magnitude tighter local dimming than the 96 zones of the Sony InZone M9, and two orders of magnitude better than edge-lit dimmed panels like the original Odyssey G7. It's fair to say the HDR experience is clearly better than both of those monitors, which I'd class as having a basic HDR experience and a poor semi-HDR experience respectively. When you combine a good number of dimming zones with a great native contrast ratio, you end up with an HDR experience that has a low amount of blooming. That's not to say you won't see blooming or raised blacks in some circumstances, but most of the time these issues are hard to notice. The only content I'd say really struggles with this sort of backlight are star fields and other very small bright highlights, which only OLEDs can display properly. The majority of the time, you'll be seeing deep blacks and a really strong HDR experience with bright highlights. Just make sure you view the display dead on, because viewing at an off angle will show much more blooming due to the panel's mediocre viewing angles. However, there are multiple ways to implement a local dimming algorithm, and Samsung have chosen an algorithm specifically to minimize blooming. This has the effect of reducing peak brightness for some bright highlights at times. Basically, you have to choose one issue or the other, either the backlight zone is dim so that dark areas are dark but bright areas aren't so bright, or the backlight is bright so you get the best brightness in bright areas but dark areas are a bit raised. I don't have an answer for you as to which algorithm choice looks better because clearly there are many times where the Neo G7 looks amazing and produces deep blacks with minimal blooming alongside bright highlights. In real world gaming examples, I saw over a thousand nits of brightness, comparable to other true HDR displays. But then at times the algorithm chooses to minimize brightness and on occasion displays elements that should be well over 700 nits at around say 300 nits, lower than even the AW3423DW OLED. 
I've also seen a few issues for game HUDs, as one example where the content around the HUD is dim, so the HUD is also dim and it should probably be a bit brighter. Despite this, I'd still rate the HDR experience reasonably highly from this panel, and better than an IPS equivalent like the PG32 UQX, as ugly blooming is far less common. While I do think the Neo G9 is a very good HDR monitor in many aspects, I did find some concerning results. One is full screen sustained brightness. The Neo G7, when displaying either mostly bright scenes or bright flashes, can't actually get that bright. It tops out at 345 nits, which is not significantly higher than my result in the SDR mode, and worse than both the Odyssey G7 and Odyssey Neo G7. This is a poor result that is well short of most HDR monitors. As for 10% window brightness, there's good and bad news. The good news is that 350 nits of performance is really only restricted to full screen content. For small content, the Neo G7 can exceed 1000 nits, which is better than many other monitors aside from the PG32 UQX. This is achievable in test patterns and real world examples. However, Samsung advertises this as a 2000 nit monitor, and achieving 2000 nits simply isn't realistic. I could only ever hit 2000 nits, actually up to 2300 nits, in a pure 10% window test pattern. Even slightly modifying this pattern, such as changing it to a 10% window with 1% APL, reduced the brightness recorded to around 1230 nits, which is the number I'm reporting in the end as I feel it's more realistic. The Neo G7 can only hit the advertised 2000 nits in a specific pattern, which appears to be detected by the monitor to enter some sort of special performance mode. Again, I did not actually see 2000 nits of performance in any other circumstance, including all real world content examples. As such, the Neo G7 performs like this at different window sizes most of the time, using realistic test conditions, and when avoiding Samsung's apparent 2000 nit cheat mode. While I think advertising this as a 2000 nit monitor when it can't be practically achieved is highly misleading, I don't think its actual results in the 1200 nit range are a deal breaker. 1200 nits is still quite bright, plenty for HDR gaming and especially good at the Neo G7's price point. For full screen multi frame contrast, the Neo G7 is capable of an infinite contrast ratio. This is because the backlight can be fully switched off when displaying a full black image, which is ideal behavior. For best case single frame contrast, the Neo G7 hits over 800,000 to 1, which might as well be infinite because blacks are very dark in these instances. This puts most edge lit panels to shame, as well as weaker HDR monitors like the Inzone M9. The Neo G7 is also very capable in our worst case tests, putting up the best numbers of any LCD based monitor that we've tested. The contrast ratio I recorded when a bright and dark area are close together was 50% better than the Neo G9 and almost four times better than the PG32 UQX, which uses a similar amount of dimming zones but IPS technology with a low native contrast ratio. In both comparisons, the percentage differences in native contrast are quite similar to the percentage differences in dimmed contrast, showing that native contrast is very important to delivering a better HDR experience with a given amount of dimming zones. In the checkerboard test, the high brightness contrast ratio on offer is very strong, reaching nearly 20,000 to 1, which is excellent and only surpassed by OLED panels. However, the low brightness checkerboard tested at around 70 nits is weak, indicating that at times when the general content on the screen is dim, that black levels could be lower. This is an algorithm optimization issue with how the monitor locally dims. As for HDR accuracy, Samsung's grayscale tracking implementation is good for the most part when using the best dimming mode, high, which actually performs slightly differently to the auto mode. In the high mode, dark shades are somewhat too dark in the low luminance range, and there's a small dip in performance around the midpoint of the PQ EOTF chart, but this mode gets the closest. The auto mode features raised black levels, as you can see from this difference, in the bottom 10% of the EOTF range compared to the high mode, so I wouldn't recommend it. Both modes feature similar fall off at high brightness levels, and color accuracy in the HDR mode could also be better, though it's not terrible. Lastly, we have the Hub Essentials checklist, which looks to see whether Samsung is accurately advertising the panel and whether it meets minimum performance standards. Much to my surprise, Samsung fares quite well here. The Neo G7 has the appropriate level of HDMI 2.1 support, and most areas to color performance are accurately advertised, with the exception of factory calibration. Of note here is 12-bit color support. I should mention this is only accessible over an HDMI 2.1 connection, not DisplayPort. For motion performance, Samsung calling this a 1 millisecond monitor I feel is misleading given its real performance is more like 4 milliseconds or 2 milliseconds in best case scenarios. I would prefer adjustable overdrive control as well. 
However, processing lag with local dimming disabled is decent. Then for HDR performance, the only real issue I have is Samsung almost falsely advertising 2000 nits of peak brightness, which I wasn't able to achieve in any real world content that I looked at. In the defects section, I was pleased to see no pixel inversion or flickering issues, which is good news compared to the Neo G9. However, I might have just received a good unit, so I'll be interested to hear from other owners about their experience. Overall, I've been reasonably impressed with the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7, and I think this monitor is adding to a collection of really solid HDR options for gamers in 2022. The Neo G7 isn't a flawless monitor by any stretch, but it's offering us much better capabilities at its price point than we've seen before. I mean, this is really the first 4K high refresh monitor with a mini LED backlight to be available even close to $1,000 US. What the Neo G7 does well is what I'd expect from an Odyssey product. Samsung has tuned this VA panel well for speed, offering fast response times with no appreciable dark level smearing and a good experience across the refresh range. It doesn't have the full 240Hz capabilities of the Neo G8, but I feel 165Hz is enough for a modern 4K monitor. The key selling point is the HDR experience, which I can confirm works well most of the time. The combination of a high zone count backlight and great native contrast leads to minimal blooming in HDR content while retaining a lot of the punch you should get from these displays. As far as HDR gaming monitors go, this is one of the only viable options on the market today for a proper, true HDR experience and I don't think buyers will be disappointed for the most part. Crucially, perhaps an even bigger deal than the mini LED backlight performance, is that Samsung doesn't appear to have totally botched this one. After numerous issues with the Odyssey G7, Odyssey G9 and Neo G9, the Neo G7 was shipped to me in a reasonable condition. No washing out of the HDR mode, no scan lines, no flickering. Of course, I could just be lucky and I have very little faith in Samsung's QA to have actually solved these problems for everyone, but I did buy this at retail, so I have some hope that the experience will be the same for others. The big test will be the Neo G8 when we look at that shortly. Unfortunately though, there are some issues. The HDR mode doesn't get very bright for scenes with huge amounts of bright areas. 2000 nits of brightness is impossible to achieve, and the way the dimming algorithm is optimized to minimize blooming does have a few drawbacks. Factory calibration was also mediocre, and I'm still not a fan of the 1000R curve on these sorts of monitors. The Neo G7 would be far better as a flat panel, and I think the curve ends up limiting its versatility. I wouldn't really recommend this for productivity work, this is a gaming first monitor. As far as the competition goes, obviously I would buy this instead of the ASUS PG32UQX. The Neo G7 is less than half the price, and in my opinion delivers better looking HDR. Whether I'd buy it over the Neo G8, which typically costs $200 more, that I'm not sure. You'll have to wait for my Neo G8 review to hear my thoughts on that. I'd also strongly consider buying this over the Sony InZone M9. It is $400 more comparing MSRP, so quite a lot more expensive, but the HDR gaming experience is better. In fact, just generally speaking, I think paying a few hundred dollars more to get the mini LED backlight is worth it compared to the wealth of 32-inch 4K 144Hz monitors out there with effectively no HDR capabilities. The MSI MPG321UR-QD that we've recommended previously is around $950, and while it can do things the Neo G7 can't, it has a flat IPS panel with a very wide color gamut, for high-end gaming, I'd be very tempted to spend about 35% more and go full HDR, especially in these sorts of price tiers. What I find the hardest to make a call on is whether you should go the Neo G7 or an OLED alternative. The Alienware AW3423DW is an excellent HDR monitor with the same $1300 MSRP. It's faster and has better HDR performance due to its self-lit pixels and super deep blacks. However, it's a different format. You might specifically be after a 4K display or not want to go an ultra-wide. Similarly, you can get an LG TV in this price range, but they're also a lot larger and not necessarily equivalent. So lots of things to weigh up here, but bottom line is the Neo G7 is very competitive. Anyway, that's it for this one. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please do consider signing up to our Patreon or Floatplane accounts, where you'll gain access to things like, say, the ICC profiles we created for this review, our Discord community, uh, where you can chat about monitors, and just generally supporting the channel. The support of our Patreon and Floatplane members allowed us to buy and import the Neo G7, which certainly was quite expensive. We will be back shortly to also have a look at the Neo G8. Uh, not quite sure when the testing on that will be finished, but I'm sure you'll hear from us soon on that one. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.